Good morning, everyone. Um, I think we have the benefit of being the first session. We don't have any after lunch people here falling asleep with their laptops. Thanks for coming in, and uh, thanks for being here. We have a fantastic panel and some good subject matter. It's old hat for me. It seems that every one of these shows I'm talking about this again. But the good news is things have changed you know, in the year or six months since you've last heard about this. So uh, it becomes a, a, a very viable topic. But good morning. My name is Matt Smith, and I'm Chief Evangelist for Envato. We are a TV Everywhere platform that enables broadcasters, service providers, content creators to uh, quickly and easily bring their content to any screen um, with some complex features that are now table stakes that we'll discuss um, here uh, in a few minutes. So um, on this panel this morning, we have some pretty distinguished speakers, folks who are very familiar with this and who built some very compelling and complex products. I think you'll find interesting. I think you'll be able to derive a lot of information out of that. So with that, I'll have them introduce themselves, and then we'll just have a uh, brief and lively discussion. So, Mike, good morning. Morning, uh, Mike Brinkat. I'm responsible for Fox Sports Go and uh, Fox Sports uh, Streaming in general infrastructure. My name is Amit Ziv. I'm a VP of Business Ops Development and Strategy at Epix. Uh, Epix is a JV between Paramount Lines and MGM. Uh, we're a premium TV service. We operate four channels. Uh, Multi-platform is in the DNA of the business when we launched five years ago. Currently available in over 50 million uh, multi-channel video households. Launch on great services like AT&T U versus here, Time Warner Cable, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and TV everywhere for us has always been a huge, huge uh, strategic driver. I mean, we were probably the first premium to launch on Roku. Android, uh, PS3, PS4, we're on Xbox, I mean the list goes on and we offer uh, over 3,000 movies uh, on demand to our authenticated uh, service subscribers. Thank you. Raul? My name is Raul Dijoux, I'm uh, with AT&T uh, Video Operations, uh, and I uh, help run all the workflows for all the uh, assets that we manage on uverse.com for live and VOD. Uh, we have over 300,000 videos on the site and it's kind of a portal portal and mix of assets that we actually uh, control and ingest and others where we're doing SDKs, embedded players or all kinds of things. So it's, it's a really portal portal. Great, thank you. So to set the table for everyone, when we talk about TV everywhere today, it's different than where it was, again, six months ago, certainly 18 months ago. Um, as someone who's been doing this since the late 90s, I'm sorry to say, um, it's no longer just good enough to plug a video signal into an encoder and deliver it. Um, it has to be what I've called lately better than broadcast. And that means bringing things like closed captions and ad insertion, uh, complex metadata, advanced ad, op advanced ad operations to bear. So let's dive into what people have to think about today when they bring a TV Everywhere uh, platform to market. Mike, you were part of building a very complex product that today has streamed some of the biggest events this year. You did the World Series, you did the Super Bowl. What are some of the things that you had to think about when you sat down and, and designed the TV Everywhere platform that is Fox Sports Go? Well, the first uh, piece was to get the best quality video. And uh, the way we really went at that was uh, to place the encoders. I'm going to get fairly deep on this. We're, we're trying to get our encoders as close to the source of the video, so we're right off the control rooms of every control room at Fox. The idea was every piece of sports content that Fox Broadcast runs out of any of its facilities, we would have the best video signal. So there's two points of that. One is you need to get the, of course, the quality video, no downstream uh, captures. The second is you really have to get all the data out of the video streams, meaning the, the SCUDI 35, the 104, the closed captioning, etc., in order to be able to do this. Okay. So that's called the first challenge. Second challenge is the distribution metadata. And uh, that's probably the bigger challenge, knowing where the content is supposed to be playing out and getting that data to a place that you can join it, aggregate it, and present it out to the apps. Let's talk about that for a second. We'll get deep in a minute. but. I think sometimes it gets lost on some people, knowing the things that you know from a broadcast perspective. Talk about authentication or uh, program replacement, like the, the complex rights that go into running a program, a, a, an app like Fox Sports Go. 
Oh, that's, a, that's a deep one. Uh, essentially, you, you're, you're, you, the, the authentication and the entitlement are really two separate pieces in our world. One is authentication with the partner MVPDs. Um, the other aspect is the entitlement and recognizing the individual sports rights. So that becomes part of the scheduling metadata that I talked about before. Creating metadata rules as you ingest schedule content in that are reflected by sport and then match the distribution and then the entitlement uh, enforcement. I mean, similar requirements for your service? Do you have to know where a user is and when they can and can't watch content? What are some of the complexities? Uh, you know, ours is a little less complex, I would say, from a rights <coughs> perspective. I mean, we're an authenticated premium service, so uh, as long as a Epix subscriber to one of our MVPD partners logs in and authenticates, uh, you know, that's then, it, you know, then it's, uh, th then they're entitled to, uh, to our entire service. So, um, you know, we, our, our priority is to make sure that our titles and our brand is available across all platforms and the complexities really come into play or how we prioritize which platforms to build for. And, uh, and obviously we want, uh, we want to, we need to be able to scale. So, you know, when, when you look at the smart TV ecosystem, for example, and, you know, they, historically they've employed uh, sort of mixed platform strategies. And uh, it's, it's a challenge when you want to build for, you know, Samsung when they employ, you know, different operating systems or whatever other uh, uh, connected device category. But for us, you know, game consoles have been a huge priority. Xbox 360, soon to be Xbox One. Uh, PlayStation 3 and 4 and uh, you know for us uh, ultimately it's adding value to our, to our subscribers and uh, our MVPD partners. So for you it's about reach and about distribution 24 by 7 live linear there's accessibility not really... reach um, and ease of use right yeah. Well what about Uverse? What are, what are the things you think about? You've got a variety of different partners. What's the yeah? I mean, like? that, that's right there. The challenge where you just said you have a variety of different partners, right? And so, you know, we get to uh, the joy of putting together different content providers, and they each have their different challenges. You have studio content that might have some of the highest quality restrictions when it comes to DRM and all that, uh, and so you have to abide by those MPAA guidelines. And then you have sports content like what Mike does with Fox Sports that has a lot of challenges due to the sports restrict, uh, the restrictions on the content, the blackouts, uh, all that. So we, you know, and then you divide that up into VOD and live, and that's a whole other ballgame. So, you know, when you're trying to do blackouts on live, uh, we, might, we might say, okay, well, we're not going to do that content because it's such a hard thing or a liability you know, to make sure that we're within the blackouts. But they provide the signals already blacked out if we use their embedded player. So we might just say, we'll use the Fox embedded player, and we integrate it into our system. And for our users, that embedded player looks just like if it was part of eVerse.com. Okay. And for other content, like studio content from Epix, we might take that content and take the 50 meg per second mass file, take all the data, transform it, put it across all our TV Everywhere platforms, and make it available to the user to provide the best experience. And it also looks like part of Uverse.com. And you can't really tell the difference, but me as part of video operations, I gotta see what's the best thing, time to market, what's more cost effective, and what gives the best user experience. And maybe sometimes you start with an embedded plan, you build up to your own thing, but you know, we make those decisions uh, accordingly. And they're just, you know, half of it's business decisions, half of it's contracts. I get to the fund to evaluate the contracts and they'll be like, uh, you need to do, you know, uh, every year as technology changes and contracts change, they sometimes add different technical things in there, like saying, well, now you all can only use these DRM technologies or you must have uh, content ID single license per asset <coughs> DRM uh, versus, you know, other DRMs and, and so forth. And, uh, you know, in what we thought maybe 15 years ago that would be a more consolidated world when it comes to video, I think we can say that right now it's some of the most fragmented, even though we're all using MPEG, you know, the same codec, uh, when it comes to 
platforms, DRM technology, it's like the most fragmented thing there is, unless you're controlling your own destiny and you're doing apps, right? Um, but in the browser world, which I live in a lot, it's very, very hard to deal with. And actually, just to sort of dovetail on what you're saying, and from the programmer side, you know, we try also to be as flexible as possible uh, in terms of the, our workflow. So, you know, with uh, with our MVPDs and their uh, their access points, we depending on what their requirements are or what's the most efficient process for them, we'll end up either just delivering assets uh, within our existing uh, scheduling workflow, you know, delivering standard MES files, or if they prefer that we embed our player, we can do that as well. Um, and, and what you were saying earlier about rights, uh, you know, to your point, uh, linear view D, in-home, out-of-home, those are all big uh, rights grants as part of uh, the overall content package that we uh, that we structure in our MVPD relationships. So you're all pioneers. You blaze the trail, and others are following. I don't want to overstate that, but you're all okay. you've all built these products, and you've been to market early. So a, a, kind of similar to what we just discussed there. Is there anything else anyone wants to add about an oops or a gotcha? Not necessarily something that was embarrassing, but one of those where, as a technologist, you went, "Wow, we can't get there from here." What have you? you know, was, is there a lesson learned as you built these platforms over the last say year and a half or so? I don't think it, I don't think at Fox you have that option. No, <laughs> um, you must succeed. You will succeed. Uh, I think that the biggest challenge we have at this point, or some of the bigger challenges, are um, obviously the local ad insertion, as our rights deals require us to put in ads from the actual over-the-air station in the content that is relevant to them or in their inventory. We also have MVPD. Uh, local inventory that we have to honor in some way. Uh, so the stitching uh, stitching services are really the, the next challenge on our plate. Okay, that's a great topic that I want to pick up in just a second. We, we've been doing stitching for about a year on one of our on one of our networks right. or on FBC. And you're definitely an early uh, pioneer. I mean, a, a thought, any, any gotchas or pitfalls that you see? Uh, you know, I don't know if I call them gotchas, but, you know, just some lessons learned in general. So, you know, we, we, we get the pitches from platforms all the time when they come out with their new, uh, you know, their new version or whatever it may be where they tell us, you know, you can build for this device category and you can reuse 95% of the code for for the game console. And you know what, in our experience, as much as we want to believe that, it just generally doesn't fly. It's a different experience. One's lean back, one's not. One's, uh, you know, touch screen, one's not. Um, we've had to fork code before because, you know, we were told that, you know, one app would be, you know, could port over to, uh, to the next uh, gen device. Um, so for us, it's really just getting smarter and, uh, and more efficient and we build for and to understand also that the existing platforms are continuously, you know, Android is, or, you know, most, most of you know, continuously comes out new versions and in order to uh, get promotional marketing support with that platform, which is impactful in terms of feature placement or whatever it may be, you have to keep up with those, uh, with those updates. So that's, you know, that's a big learn, learning for us as well. Good. Thank you. So Mike touched on DAI or digital ad insertion. Um, subject that's near and dear to my heart because I've been working on it for things like five years. Um, and early iterations of it were such to where you could interpret markers in a broadcast signal, act on them, and replace those ads. But I want Mike to talk with, to touch on how complex it's gotten to be because it's no longer just as simple as marking the beginning and the end of a break and inserting a bunch of ads. There are local ads, there are national ads, there are in-market ads and out-of-market ads, there are ads that are uh, play through with the broadcast, and there's been a negotiation to where they play through in the, in the streaming equivalent. So, Mike, t talk to us about DAI and, and how it works at Fox Sports. Well, again, uh, we're integrated with the broadcast system. So when we get, or we've, uh, we've gotten the, down to the point of getting full ad pod duration information, local ad markers, return to program, uh, Markers and everything, so that the first point is to make sure that you've gotten uh, all the all the relevant data you require from the broadcast system. The second part is integration into the ADS and how you make the the ad decision system, how you make it work, and making sure there's enough metadata associated with the content, both in band in the video and outside in the play request or in the player itself. Then the third challenge is when you go down the stitcher path or the you know the server side uh, stitching 
is the actual ad reporting and making sure that the client side ad reporting is adhered to, otherwise you're not going to get paid for the ads. So I think those challenges all coupled together become the, the most yeah. difficult part. And the moral of the story is it's a complex world, right? I think uh, uh, the requirements have gotten steeper recently um, than, than easier. Um, and that kind of leads us into technology. So when you look at how you build these infrastructures, um, I just remember a few years ago where it seemed like you had you know, a vendor for this, a vendor for this, a vendor for this, and you had to hope that there was enough connective tissue in the API so that, that things that fired here were observed downstream. Has it gotten better? Are we, are we doing better as technologists and vendors so that as you build these things that your decision-making process or your loss or, or retention of your hair has gotten better or worse? Mike? Mike, okay. <laughs> Uh, well, I've got hair still. You're um, doing good. I think uh, the key, and you're pointing out one of the one of the key factors to a quick success or to, to moving the ball quickly, is the player technology being coupled with the uh, the encoder technology and coupled with the scheduling system, so that scheduling data, metadata, can be uh, injected into the actual video stream, and then the player understands how to read it. And this is something that's hard to move with multiple vendors. And I think that's a, a key point that we recognized fairly early in this. I'm sure it can be done, but uh, at this point, uh, we're trying to move very quickly. So. Jimmy, any thoughts? <sighs> Not really on the back end. I mean, I would say on the front end, sort of, you know, just from a different perspective. Um, you know, I think the the space is sort of well baked enough to. Uh, to pick and choose our uh, dev shops that have done it and do it well, and uh, and you know you, you do want to innovate in terms of uh, new feature sets, but uh, ultimately, um, you know, in terms of client development, there we we've sort of rationalized our uh, vendor portfolio, if you will, over the last uh, year or so, and um, uh, you know. Some of them, some of them uh, historically, you know, it's aren't uh, aren't exactly the most efficient or uh, innovative in terms of the builds, and, and some do well, and some are uh, sort of registered or uh, certified by the platform, and that's sort of how we. And that helps inform your decisions, though. Oh yeah, certainly. I mean, who have they built for before? And or the innovation piece. And and around uh, the innovation piece, sort of, are, are they a little more creative in terms of uh, UX UI and. Um, that's so. That's sort of the stuff we think about. What about the back end pieces, Raul? What do you think? Has it gotten more efficient? Are you seeing improvements in the technology and the, the architecture of the platforms? I mean, there's definitely improvements. Uh, but what's amazing is that you know, in I don't know, uh, 19, 18 years of me doing encoding for a living and charging at some point three hundred dollars a minute of each variant, uh, it's, you know, I think they would just be plug and chug nowadays and somebody would take like handbrake and do it, but it's still a black art when it gets to our level of quality, right? Uh, taking the 50 meg per second assets that they're sending you now over the public internet, uh, doing all that. And so it's still a handful of people that do it really well. And then there's just a lot of people that just do it average if you're just trying to make a YouTube video. Um, I'm not saying YouTube quality is not good. I'm just saying, you know, if you're just trying to make a clip for yourself. Um, so you do have to know who you're dealing with. The advantage we have is that, the, you know, this type of environment is, is very close, and a lot of the people that have worked in the streaming industry still work in it. So you know who's, who does good work, what vendors deliver on time, who's good at UI but maybe not good at back end, who's a good integrator, who's good at hardware technology, satellite acquisition, all that stuff. Because there's not a lot to pick from. Because the ones that were bad, they just didn't make it. And then there's broadcasters that just decide to do it in-house, like Fox Sports and so. But uh, I, I think there's a lot of good shops that are best of breed shops. And they have some really talented people that can put together and architect something that will work. Um, it's just you just got to make sure that you have somebody on your team that's experienced that knows what's happening so they can call thumbs up or thumbs down on, on a particular thing. It seems like from a technology perspective, at least with the 
the code, well, not, not the codec, I don't want to get into a religious war here, but the, it seems like HLS everywhere is, has become the pervasive strategy. Is that, that you guys are doing I, that? I think it, it is, in when you, like I said, when you have full control over the platform, it is. Uh, and by full control, I mean it's kind of a private SDK. So, you know, if you're developing an app for Android, iOS, and, and so forth, there are enough frameworks out there by different vendors and players that you can create a TV everywhere, HLS everywhere kind of base platform. And then you might have a couple of variants. You know, you might have like Xbox that requires its own little thing. But for the most part, you might be, you, you'd be pretty good. The problem occurs, I want to be, you know, I think that the internet, in my personal opinion, is going a little bit back to the browser. And to just, you know, eventually devices, why do I have to have a special app and all these 20 apps and download all these apps to just have, you know? And so it would be nice to be able to do things in the browser. And that is where now it becomes difficult uh, because now you're depending on the browser and for rights and everything, and not all the browsers support everything yet. HTML5 common encryption is not there yet. Uh, but when it does, you know, years from now, I think that'll be the way to go. And so that, if you're trying to go into that environment, you're still going to hit a lot of speed bumps. Um, but HLS everywhere, if I was doing my own apps, yeah. But now you, but then you got to support all these apps. Like Amit said, Android is not just one platform, you know, it's a variety. And so you get in that, but there's, there's enough vendors out there. You see some really high quality stuff. And I'm not just talking U.S., you start looking at where Asia is in Europe, and you see some incredible stuff out there. What are some of those apps? Be the moderator. <laughs> in, 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 uh, in Asia, I mean, are there ones that you've seen? Well, that I do, mean, do really I think well? I see, you know, stuff that's more like Dash heavy. Like, what's interesting is, like, you might see, um, and, and I don't know if this is the case, I haven't seen it lately, but, like, you know, where people might use a vendor, like HBO, um, was doing their app here, uh, and they were developing. But then for HBO Asia, they had somebody else doing oh, it. Okay. And the little nuances, and, and the fact that in Asia they could, you know, they were they they were into doing Dash there, way ahead of time. So they kind of used that as their prototype. Like, well, we want to do Dash in the U.S., but it's not there yet. But in Asia, we can push it because maybe the market is smaller because they're just going to go into Korea first and something like that. So they push that kind of edge, and you're like. Well, that's cool. I mean, we were talking about Dash in 2007. Oh, it's coming. It's going to be here any day. We're in 2014, going in 2015, and we still don't use it in the U.S. that much. We're just now, you know, I think this year, finally, you, you see technologies taking it, you know. Dash seems to be like soccer in the U.S. It's the technology of the future, <laughs> and it always will be. And the metric system. <laughs> and the metric system. Uh, anyway, any, other, any other thoughts there? Okay. Um, so... Mike, we talked about this offline, but um, you were talking about the complexities of uh, entitlement, program replacement. So what can the industry do more effectively so that from a technology perspective, an architecture perspective, when, as you evolve your platform, you're using things like um, the you know, SCUDI messaging, the ASMI and ESAM um, messaging. What are the things that we need to think about you know, six months and 12 months down the road? I think you, you hit on two of them, or one of them, depending on how you look at it, but ESNI and ESAM are probably the most important things for us to think about and probably for the downstream of the MVPDs for distribution syndication. It's, we have to do something about that. As our role as distributing for uh, uh, Fox Sports or Fox Sports Go, we have reciprocal agreements where all of our MVPDs need to get the same content with the same right structure. So we have to be able to facilitate that both in a syndication player model as a uh, as, uh, gentleman down there. I'm sorry. Well, wrong. <laughs> um, and then there's the, uh, the other distribution model where we're directly giving the signal to an MVPD. And then they have to get that, the rights information, both in-band, the SAM data, and the ESNI data that will, that will allow them to correctly distribute it as our rights restrict them. Well, what about in AT&T's world? How does, are there requirements, are there complex requirements like that where you have to authenticate someone based on their geolocation? And oh, yeah. I mean, that's, like, like I said, and it starts at the lawyer level. Like, I always tell everybody that I've been in this, you know, 
technology world of streaming for a long time, but in my world, technologists don't create, you know, these solutions lawyers do because, you know, if the contract says you can't do it, you can't do it. But, you know, um, so yeah, some of the stuff now, I mean, I'm seeing a lot of stuff in contracts. Uh, SCUDI, you know, SCUDI is like the big thing. It's always been big, but I think it's going to be bigger this year and next year as to like really you have to be, in on a, you know, last year we had closed captioning, uh -huh. uh, you know, became a mandate. So everybody was scrambling for that, even though you think we, you know, we were doing it already, but were we doing it on everything? Were we doing it on live linear and on VOD? You know, and now it's like, well, you get fine, so you got to do that. I think things are becoming, uh, there's going to be less and less of a difference between the TV, and I think there already is, and, you know, a tablet where you can see. And so that's the idea, right? When you can just, like we saw some of the stuff on the keynote today, most people are watching stuff on a, on a device that's either a tablet or mobile. Um, desktop is secondary. TV is going to, you know, go away. Uh, for certain things, because it, it makes sense. Um, so, so I think those are the things that, that are going to come in. And when it comes to geo rights and all that, it gets really complex. Uh, with sports, you have all the blackout systems. But uh, the good thing about our, you know, being an MVPD is that we know our, our area. You know, if it's US only or this area, and, and we conform to those standards. We use a CDN where we can, uh, or internally, um, Amit touched on it. There are thing, you know, there's content that only has in-home rights, which you're like, really? And uh, you know, slowly but surely, the lawyers are working to try to just get that all out of home, so I don't have to deal with that. But we do detection of people in home, so because we control the internet, it's going to be fairly easy for us because we control, we know the IP of that set-top box and so forth. But if you're a provider that doesn't, I mean, I don't know, you, you know, how you're going to do it. You know, they can spoof you all day long. And, and it's, it's a pain in the butt, you know, to do that. But we have to do it because the contract says we do, and, and we, we do it because we'd rather do that and get some content than not get content. Statement of the day. Raul controls the Internet. <laughs> Did I say that? <laughs> One of the challenges I know that we talked about, again, offline, Mike, was you know, and it's maybe it's specific to sports, but you have events that sometimes go over a scheduled end time, right? If it's an overtime in an NFL game or yeah. extra innings. So talk about the, the complexity it creates for you and, and educate the audience here, people who are watching the stream. What do we need? What's the problem you need to solve for to help you uh, with those events in the future? Stick to the time. End games on time. <laughs> yeah, end games right then. I think the biggest challenge, obviously, we, we catch the ends of the events. The, the bigger challenge, and we can turn off the video, or we can end the event at the encoder level, but shall we say removing or changing the EPG or the program guide to reflect that is, is a bigger challenge. And then there's a, another inherent issue with uh, the 10 second segments of HLS, but that's, that's another issue entirely. The biggest challenge is ending an event reflecting that, getting that data out to the, ac the actual application, and then removing the program or removing access to the program itself. That's so let's solve that challenge. Problem. But you'd almost think that that would be, that would be easier in the online world than, than broadcast, right? Because right now, nope. you can watch events all day long, and you look at your EPG on your set-top box, and you're like, Man, that thing is wrong. I'm not watching Learner Report right now. This is a sports show or whatever. I think I, it's like I, Mike said, though. We can stop the video. We can, we can do things to the content, but it's the environment around it where we're, we're still having challenges in terms of saying this is no longer accessible. The event is ending. I think that the other part of that, maybe it, maybe it will help to elaborate a little bit, is a single event to us could be 400 events in theory at the edge, how yep. it's articulated through the call signs and how it's uh, articulated with whatever network it's on. And getting all of those objects updated, out, distributed out to the edge, and having that happen in a, in a timely manner is, is the challenge. So it's not, if it was a single object, it would probably be far simpler. But, but or, since you said you control the stuff at the encoder level, if the trigger is in there, it just automatically will be in all 400. So here's an example of where that doesn't work. You're trying to kill a program that you're not watching, mm -hmm. right? So if, you're, if your application has an EPG that shows you 
25 programs airing at this time, you get the signal for that piece of content that just ended if you were watching it. So unless you're uh, actually watching the video stream of the metadata around the, the video streaming and band vet video, you're not going to know that that other event ended. So you have to take another data source to do that. It's easy to end the event, or easier to end the event itself and remove that chip in theory, or that, uh, that token on whatever, however the application articulates it, but uh, removing other ones is, is far more difficult. It's not, a, it's not an unsolvable problem. Yeah. Great discussion. We have a few minutes for questions if anyone has uh, anything they'd like to ask the panelists. Don't be shy. Wow. All right. All right. Anything we haven't touched on you guys want to talk about? We could well, dive into the, all these announcements recently, but that gets into religion and politics between HBO and Showtime and Univision. And we CBS. did that last week. We did that in New York. Yeah, we exactly. We did. <laughs> well, good. Well, thank you. Uh, oh, sorry. Yeah, can you elaborate on the 10-second HLS segment? Well, yeah. 10 second segment, if you kill it at the encoder level and you don't kill it correctly, it's just going to loop that last segment whenever you go to play the content. So you'll see 10 seconds over and over again. What about controlling that on your uh, player application or no? Is that just because that's part of the iOS player you're using? I mean, In, in the case of iOS, yes. So. And again, you know, these, are, these are solvable things. Yeah, it's, just, yeah. It's, not, uh, it's something to watch out for. Anyone else? Are you talking to me? Yeah. Okay. Well, we use a, a, a few vendors. Um, we, use, uh, we use a vendor to aggregate all of the TMS, Tribune Media Services data. We bring that into Stats Inc. data, so we create, call it data blobs for scheduling. Um, we use this uh, Envato for the scheduling and the encoder system. If that's the level of question you want to ask. Uh, are, you, are you interested in the vendors or the, the actual technology? No, I was just thinking, do you want to use vendors or you guys own that? I know a lot of publishing networks like own their own APIs. You want control of that and that's the brains of so it's really a collaborative effort with our vendors. Right. Any questions back there? Uh, I thought it was, yeah, go ahead. It, it, it has to do with the content, though. So yeah, you got to exactly. put yourself in the keynote. That's that's football. So uh, but also know, short form versus long it, form. Exactly, short form versus long form. It's football highlights, all that stuff. Uh, you know, you're carrying. Everybody carries a smartphone nowadays, pretty much. So it's that's why it's so high. On longer form content, what you'll see is you'll see the tablet actually rules over the phone. So it just kind of has to do, you know, so short form content will, you know, you'll probably have about the same balance, tablet and mobile, if you squinge those together, desktop, and then the other right. devices. It, probably what the NFL showed is pretty close to what I see. Um, and I see stuff across dozens of content providers. So I get to, you know, chop it up and say, well, sports content kind of has this metric, studio content, or, you know, Game of Thrones, uh, you know, really pirate. So, so you you know, it, it's very content dependent. But uh, you you could say that twenty five to thirty three percent of it is desktop, and then you know you have fifty to sixty percent is going to be tablet, mobile, and then the rest could be connected devices. And in some cases, connected devices get really small. It all depends on the content. If you see his his data point showed for time spent uh, for long form was, was game consoles, and that's long form viewing. And in our experience, 
Now we we have we're a movie service, so if you want to watch The Hunger Games with Wolf of Wall Street, you're going to want to watch it on an Xbox or a Roku as opposed to it's a little, little, a little forward. Yeah, exactly. So for us, we're seeing we certainly see uh, streaming media devices and game consoles. Uh, on a monthly basis, the most downloads, the most time spent, um, you know, we're seeing uh, subscribers are, are completing at least a full movie, so they're spending, you know, average time per account of north of an hour and a half, almost two hours, um, and, uh, and you know what, we, we do see a lot more, um, a lot more usage lately on Android as well, um, but uh, but in general, I think it's to your point. It's, Tablet it's, over mobile. Yeah, you know, it's just driven. For, for it's, your it, it, yeah, it depends on the content type, and I think again, lean back for long form viewing, no question. It's just a better. Experience. It varies by length and by content type. We talked about this in New York. I think there's a misperception, I think, by some of the industry that the viewer will always default to the 60 inch screen. I think that's a flawed idea because it's going to vary, as we've just discussed, by the type of content and the length of the content. People will not always go toward the 60-inch screen. You don't want to watch a seven-second vine on the 60-inch screen, right? There's a reason that it lives on the screen it lives on. But, but I think there was a data point out there, like Reed Hastings said, that the majority of Netflix consumption comes through game consoles as primary IP access points hooked up to TVs. Big screen, right? Uh, but that's and, longer, that's and, longer and because it's long-form viewing, and yeah. you know we have the same experience, and that's how we've prioritized our uh, our efforts. Yeah, and it, if you looked at kids' content and stuff like that, you'll see it like very high on the tablets, right. you know. So it's it's very content dependent. Um, the other thing that they touched on today, uh, which was interesting, that I think you know we've been talking about for years and years, but I think it's become, is uh, personalization and intelligent decision, you know, recommendation engines and all that. And you've seen it for years now with Netflix, and now you're seeing it with the NFL and and other stuff, but. Uh, you know, it plays a big thing in, in the MB, MVPD world, like me, to be able to take all these things and then provide. So I think that's going to be a big thing for, for next year. Good. Anyone else? Go ahead. So the question is, are we trying to cram broadcast into digital? So that's the broadcaster first. <laughs> well, Based on the rights, we probably are, yes. It's really, the rights, the distribution rights are directly aligned with the linear rights or broadcast rights. But the experience is a bit different, yes? It is. Uh, I think we're more event-based than we are channel-based when it comes to the experience. So you're really, when you go to the, uh, the tablet or, or the phone or whatever, you're looking for an event specifically, I think. You're not looking for the, uh, the actual channel. I think those lines are getting blurred more and more. I don't really, I work with the TV side of our, you know, part, but I really focus on the online experience, but I've been, I used to work in, you know, broadcast channels and stuff like that. So I think more and more things, and, and as I see workflows, they're going more to broadcast and TV ever should be all one workflow. Mm -hmm. And that's things that all these MVPDs and everybody's been trying to do. It's the holy grail. We've been trying to do it for years, but... Let's face it, it's hard to take your broadcast equipment that's you got millions and millions of dollars invested and all that stuff and take that culture because the broadcast culture is very unique and then try to accommodate it for everyone. And I think that as, you know, in the last couple of years I've seen it more and more. Uh, some guys are already there, some aren't. We're working towards it. And, and I think, you know, five years from now, Broadcast and online will, will be hopefully one big happy family or closer to that. Time for one more question. Anyone else? Go ahead. How do you deal with this constantly evolving codex? So, you know, a while back there was like MPEG 2, MPEG 4, now it is HLS, MPEG dash in Asia, as we talked about. You're obviously heavily invested in infrastructure for hardware and software to create certain types of files like for mobile and desktop. And this is obviously going to be a constant evolution. Got a question around the codex and file types. I would argue that things have. I think that's gotten easier. Yeah, I mean, I mean, let's face it. I think it was two thousand and 
1 or 2000 when I first saw the H.264 codec on a QuickTime player at Macworld or something. No, maybe it was QuickTime Live or some, something like that. But, uh, and it really didn't become, I mean, if you're in this industry, we could see the codecs, right, way ahead of time. It's gonna, we know that it's going to take five years to even get to, to really becoming useful. Um, we're seeing H HEVC, you know, we've been talking about it for a couple of years, and it'll be, you know, it's already there in some applications, but is it going to replace 264 right now? Not immediately. It will. It's going to take its time. So we have plenty of leeway to do I don't. I think it's easier now because it's not so hardware dependent. Uh, exactly. For some really specific things, you want hardware because they'll give you the best quality, especially when you're talking about like live, you know, certain things like that. But even then, some of those hardware devices can update to a new codec pretty easily. They're not, you know, it's not all ingrained. They're just processors and, you know, specific graphics hardware that, that is doing all that heavy, you know, GPU processing and all that stuff. So I think it's a lot easier. I don't think that we're going to suddenly change overnight, uh, you know, and, uh, and it, it's all uh, ROI, right? So, do I invest in this to get 30% uh, more bandwidth on my network? So everybody's got a different you know, perspective. I want to increase bandwidth or reduce costs. Uh, but it's really not going to happen. I think it's not, you know, until 4K becomes a reality or people start having 4K and actually getting 4K content, and as long as it doesn't go the way of the laser disc, um, then, you know, then, then that'll push the envelope for the next codec. Uh, and you never know. Somebody might develop even a better codec, but but it's. I think it's easier nowadays. We'll try. Any other thoughts on HLS? Has it? I think got, things gotten simpler there, Mike. Far. Yeah. Very much simpler. Okay. With that, I say thank you for your questions. Thank you, panelists, for great information. Uh, thank you for attending. Hope you've enjoyed the session and have a great day.